But I'm also delighted to um, introduce to you some things that have come out of research that has already been published, but also some more ongoing research into connections between the anamorphs and teleomorphs in the Pisaeus One thing I want to clarify before I really begin is to let you know that I'll be talking about these as mitospores and mitospore-bearing hyphae because we're not sure what the um, function is, and the function may, may actually vary from one group to the next, so we can just um, avoid any uh, miscommunication by calling them mitospores. And I'd also like to point out that this was not done by myself alone, but in collaboration with Matthew Smith, Greg Bonito, and Don Feaster, as well as a host of others who helped in many ways. So what I did was to comb the literature to look for um, all of species that had been connected, the, where anamorphs had been connected to teleomorphs, in the P. zizales um, and made a, uh, those which had uh, large subunit sequences, I put into an alignment of 376 taxa, not all of, of which were anamorph producers, but just so that I could have um, a representation of the P. zizales, although I did leave out three families that have not been shown to produce anamorphs. Um, but those are small families, Carbomycetaceae, Glazialaceae, and Carstenolaceae. Okay. And what I've done is color code um, each of the groups, the clades, that have um, a different appearing anamorph so that you can see the variety of, of morph types of anamorphs within the P. zizales. And just a brief history, somebody mentioned yesterday that the Tulane brothers were the first people to make a connection, and they did this simply through observation of um, anamorph produ being produced at the sp same time in the same place. And in this case, it was with Pisiza vesiculosa, um, and the anamorph was known as Edocephalum over time. Um, this was followed up by Brefield, who cultured this, and then got the Edocephalum in culture. And the culturing is the main way that people were getting the anamorphs and making teleomorphs um, over time. Uh, for example, Molliard found a connection between Costantinella, the anamorph of Morkella, and also found anamorphs, which became known as Mer Mollardiomyces in the Sarcocypha and Sarcocyphaceae. And I'm, I'm not going to mention everybody who's been involved, but John Payden had um, quite an influence be and had done a lot of work with culturing. Um, and one point I just wanted to make in showing this slide is that this is him as a graduate student in 1966 in I Idaho. Um, just to point out that it's easy to stand here and do an overview of work that has been done very meticulously over time culturing things and carefully recording and drawing the anamorphs from them. So it's really fun to stand back and look at these from the other's perspective after sequencing and then matching them up and then looking for the morphology that makes, makes, helps to make sense of them. Stanley Hughes came up with a system for classifying, as everybody here would probably know, but just to point out that in his classification system, which was based on Canidia and Canidia for development, um, the P. zizales mostly show up in se his section 1b and section 2. And Edocephalum um, looks like this. It doesn't make, uh, I never recovered this from nature, I, I suppose because they don't make very um, big, obvious spore mats. But Edocephalum um, produces usually a, a globose head with spores that are produced on denticles simultaneously. And the form of it can be from globose to uh, ovate to actually elongate, as you can see with this species. Um, or it can be highly reduced, as in these species these species where it's simply producing spores at the end of a, um, a hyphal branch. 
So the Edicephalum may, are mainly showing up in the Pisciza sensu stricto group, which is in purple here, and then another Pisciza group down here, but also Iotophanus. And then this is Pisciza qualipidodia that I color coded differently because it has a bit of a different look to it, although if you use your imagination, you can think that this is perhaps a very um, elongated edicephalum that is not swollen. Um, this is, edis, this is um, Edelpha pabingtonia in the Pachyella lineage um, with a reduced type of edicephalum. Gregoire Hennebert untangled the Botrytis-like Pisciselles anamorphs, and the three that I want to um, talk most about today are the Chromolosporium, Ostracoderma, and Gliscoderma that he um, drew beautifully um, and helped to distinguish by virtue of whether they had a peridium, what the branching looked like, and whether the spores were smooth or ornamented. So we'll begin with the Chromolosporium-like asexual forms, and those are all col color-coded in blue. Um, they have um, mitospore-bearing structures that are pretty evenly of even length, with the spores all produced at the same time along the whole branch. Um, and that shows up in this lineage here that um, is a blue anim a, a blue spore mat, which I'll show you in a moment, um, and also in Plicaria, but also in Rulandiella, and in a clade for which we have no teleomorph data. Pisciza ostracoderma um, is one that, that is a species that shows up on mushroom beds and in greenhouses, and um, Corf named. Uh, unfortunately, as Ostracoderma, but it produces a Chromolosporium-like anamorph um, that looks like this. Plicaria is described as having Ostracoderma or, or Chromolosporium-like um, anamorph, but you can see that it differs in its di um, dichotomous branching. And what I wanted to point out here was the similarity between the Edicephalum, the elongated form, and the Chromolosporium. It begins to make a little sense that these are all in one family when you see those similarities. Um, th we found this blue spore mat in no Northeast United States and sequenced it, and it came out to um, a lineage that includes a, a teleomorph, which is a baziza from China, interestingly, and a spore mat from Denmark. And I, I don't know if that was a blue one or not, but it differs from the others um, in, in that at least this one has a cinemata and very much um, answers the description for, us, for chromolosporium carolescens. That is this group right here. Then this group is the one that has no teleomorph that we know. And I have been deliberately sequencing as many pizizes as I can come across, trying to find the teleomorph of this group. Um, this, I've got sequences of spore mats and ectomycorrhizal root tips from the United States, from Australia, from New Zealand, um, and from China. And, they're very common. They occur from um, spring through fall, and yet there's no um, teleomorph yet that we know of. And this is just to show you what the spores look like. In all cases, the spores that I've looked at have some sort of ornamentation to them. The Rulandiella type is also thought of as a chromolosporium, but in this case, the whole hyphal system becomes spore-bearing. Here I'd like to just talk a little bit about Richard Korf, who contributed enormously to our understanding of the P. zizales, and was particularly interested in the putative anamorphs. Um, and he made them uh, 
subject of his address is at a symposium that he was titled Mycology, Past, Present, and Future. And um, the subsequent paper was called 50 Years of Fun with the Disco Biceps and What's Left to Do. And um, 20 years later, we're still having fun with it. And the stars of his particular talk were Ostracoderma and Gliscoderma. And the reason he talked about these was because there was a mystery regarding a specimen that he had collected that he tentatively was um, calling Gliscoderma. This one is from um, Northeast United States. Uh, this one fits the concept of Gliscoderma that, um, that Foucault had made. He was the first one to describe it in 1870. But he described it as having a tenacious per persistent peridium, which eventually sl splits in the center. And he mentions a point of attachment, and he mentions um, an argillaceous ring surrounded by a white annulus. So this particular specimen that was collected by Ray back in 1912, more in from England, more um, better fits the description for Gliscoderma. So what is this that um, Richard Korff collected? Well, fortunately, he was a forward-looking um, mycologist and was very interested in finding out what it was um, from a molecular standpoint, so gave his specimen to um, Keith Eggert, and Eggert and Norman published their data showing that it came out close to Scabropezia and Pacophloas. My um, d doctoral dissertation was putting together a um, revision of the genus Pacophloas, which is now called Pacophlodes, and um, is a worldwide temperate species of truffle. And indeed, we were able to find um, more spore mats that mit match the sequence that um, Richard Korff had, had found earlier. And not only that, we recovered a sporocarp, the teleomorph for this particular species, which ends up as being an undescribed species of Pacophlodes, right in the middle of the genus. I just want to point out with this that there is Amalaskis down here, which is a sister to Pacophlodes and Scabropezia. <coughs> And I fully expect that there is a spore mat associated with this, produced by this, um, and I'm hoping that somebody here will perhaps find it. This group down here has no sporocarp that we know of. So again, there's lots of looking yet to do. So my question um, with, regarding Korf's specimen hinge, went back to what, what did, he was a very observant person, so if he thought he saw a um, peridium, he must have seen something, but I wasn't able to really detect it. So part of the problem was that when you try to section these things, um, you get kind of a goo, and you, it's hard to put it back together. So what I did was to fix it and embed it in plastic and do some sectioning, and actually did some serial sectioning so I could um, follow it through, and hopefully um, you can see, or I can convince you, that this hyphal hair, which is coming from the base, this is the top, um, is uh, interwoven with other hairs which have come to the top and form a very thin peridium. Um, and I'd also like to point out that the branches off of these hairs are are. Uh, mitospore producing. And actually, this um, particular anamorph, I think, better fits the description for Ostracoderma, which has been described as being, oh no, as being, uh, <laughs> having a very thin peridium. Um, okay, I'm going to speed ahead just to show you the colorfulness of Pacophlodes and Scabropezia and that the spore mats are um, pretty consistent within the clades. And to show you a spore mat that I'm hopeful that somebody here has seen before, it is in a lineage that is not well studied. 
the Pisiza Girardii Marcellina line lineage. This is Hydnobolites, another truffle. It produces spores that are very, um, are absolutely smooth, but have an angular appearance. Um, and I'm wondering, because it has a more robust peridium than in Pachyphloas, if perhaps um, this peridium here, which is very different from the spore producing part of it, um, might be what we are seeing in Gliscroderma. And I'm very curious about these lineages down here, including Pisiza girardii. So there's lots more collecting and looking to do. I'm going to skip over this and just um, summarize the Pisizaceae asexual morphs as being holoblastic, hyaline to brightly colored, spores are, are simultaneously produced, and the spores are single celled. And move on very quickly to the tuberaceae, which ha are in green, um, but also have Fischerula, another truffle, um, sort of in the same area phylogenetically. They all produce um, or, um, mitospore bearing branches that are verticillate and have scars back from the tips. And interestingly, this one produces another conidium at the tip of, or um, another mitospore at the tip of this spore that's being produced, which perhaps um, gives us a, an idea of whether or not it might be functioning as a, a um, spermatium. There haven't been too many cytological studies done on this. So the one species that I had, I could see that the, each cell was uninucleate, which is different from what we saw in the Pisizaceae. This is Fischerula, which is very similar in appearance, um, a bit different from um, Morchella costantinella, which we see here and is very distinctive. And I wanted to t share some research done by Lori Karras's group in um, Washington, the state of Washington, um, where she has been able to show, and this is a pre-publication data, so she, I'm, I'm very happy that she, was, she allowed me to share this with you, but she was able to show that Dysiotis has a Costantinella type of anamorph, as does Gyromitra. And the last one I'll talk to you about is Hydnocystis, which is in the Pyronemataceae. And this one has a, an anamorph that is very similar to other things in the group, including Stephensia bombasina, um, which was produced in culture, Stephensia shenori, which was produced in culture, and Ge Geopixis carbonaria. So all of these are very similar. And there is, I, just as a reminder, and I think I have to finish. <laughs> oh, one last thing. Okay, so there, we, think, we, we think that well, there was a question about whether Dicobotrys could be in two disparate lineages, one that produces Trichophaea, or one that has Trichophaea and Spherosporella, and the other one that has Pyropixis. But notice this green one here. Um, the Trichophaea spherosporella has this, this form with spores that are smooth. Pyropixis has spores that are um, varicose. And if we look at the, that green line um, lineages, it's Micronematobratris, which looks actually very similar to Pyropixis, which helps to make more sense of the Dicobotrys in that. And now I will stop. Except I want to put up my acknowledgement slide of all the people that have helped with this.